time since the last AMA we did here on Graf Grimm's. Um, the season has just been something hectic, um, some life-changing stuff happening, but um, we're here and very privileged to have um, Tom Hearn, uh, somebody I'm, I'm privileged to call a friend, um, somebody that I've I've met personally and, you know, he's super gracious and gracious enough to share his time with us today. Um, Tom's been in the Aotearoa film and television um, industry for decades and has worked on recent shows and films, uh, recent shows such as Panthers, um, films like Shadow in the Cloud and, of course, Dark Horse. Uh, Tom has a deep empathy for people and a real touch for making sure that when communicating real stories and histories, the correct respect is given. Um, so without any further ado, Etefano, uh, I'm going to bring Tom in right now. Tom, brother, kia ora, how are you? Kia ora, yeah, well. <laughs> Very well, my man, yeah, it's awesome to be here. Thank you so much for um, for the opportunity and great to reconnect with you, bro. Oh, bro, um, I've, I've spoken a little bit with you, you know, just before jumping on here about some of the things that we could jump into. And uh, for everybody listening, whether that be live or the replay of this, <clears throat> um, this space is mostly created to to pick the brains of um, creative people in the industry, so whether that be film, television, or the gaming industries. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but <clears throat> just just for a little intro, brother, um, if you could just just introduce yourself, um, however you you see fit, and then. Um, We'll jump into some, some, some cool, interesting corridor. <laughs> yeah, sounds awesome, bro. Um, yeah, we're just excited to be on here, um, and and you know, talking about what we what we do and love. Um, and you know, um, yeah, for me, um, you know, acting, um, filmmaking, storytelling has really been um, a part of my life, like since I was a little kid. Um, growing up um, down in Otutahi, um, I think I got my first acting job when I was maybe 10 years old. Um, and then I started, you know, working as a reporter for what now from when I was I was 13. Um, I actually got that job out of a, a ad in the newspaper. Um, I think it was my grandfather who actually said to me, boy, you should go and um, apply for this job. They're looking for someone for TV. And um, I went in and um, shook the producer's hand, Tony Palmer, I remember him, lovely guy. And I go, you should give me the job, mate. I'll do a good job. And, um, you know, real plucky kind of confident young fella. And, um, but yeah, so, you know, I'm 37 now and, and, um, my life, so much of my life has been dedicated in some way, shape or form to this craft. Um, and so yeah it's an honor to be here today and and just unpack some of that and share some of the things i've learned or that i'm still learning oh bro 13 on what now <laughs> i remember seeing you on what now with the big hair <clears throat> and that's like bro, it was the best job man like better than a paper run you know yeah um, of course. And, bro, it was it was awesome like got to review games review movies, interview bands when they would come. Like I got to interview some of the coolest artists of that time. Um, you know, one of them was my hero, my musical hero, Ben Harper. Um, uh, and um, I actually, um, I, I, it was an incredible thing. I heard he was coming to town and so I called him up and, um, and organized an interview and um, oh man, I was so nervous on the day. And um, I got him to sign my guitar and I asked him these, like, what I thought were really deep questions, you know, <laughs> and um, he was so gracious and cool and could tell I was such a fan. And I actually passed him a letter from my mum that day because I'd got my mum into Ben Harper and she'd become a fan too. And I still to this day don't know what was in the letter, but I passed this letter to Ben Harper and we finished the interview and about an hour later, I get a call from him and he's like, hey, Tom, it's Ben. Um, I just wanted to let you know that I got a couple of backstage tickets for you and your mom tonight. <laughs> and um, so we go to the concert and um, he, in the middle of the show, he goes, this is a song called Beloved One. It's going out to Wendy. <laughs> and that was my mom. Um, 
And so he sung this like beautiful song to my mum, and we actually went backstage and met her, met after the show. And I still don't know what was in the letter, but he was talking to some other people when we went backstage, and he just stopped that conversation as soon as he saw me and my mum, and just came and wrapped her in this massive embrace. And um, so yeah, there were lots of cool experiences, bro. But that that's one that stands out from the what nowadays, bro. That's amazing, and. Like I, we were just talking a little bit in the wings about um, how nervous I get before <laughs> jumping into to podcasts and AMAs and things with people, and in particular with people that I haven't met. So, bro, I imagine I would have been shitting myself like before, you know, <laughs> Ben Harper. Like, how did you even prepare yourself, bro, for that? Oh, uh, bro, I've always had big nerves. Eh? Like, I just have to work with it. Like, I get really nervous. Um, and sometimes people, you know, can't tell. People who know me will be able to tell. But, um, yeah, I always get nervous before public speaking or a big meeting or just anything that feels like it's got stakes attached to it. And I, I think that kind of ties into just how much I care. Um, like I'm, you know, I'm really hard on myself about my own, like, work standards. And I always just want to do my best work. I'm, you know... I'm striving for like perfectionism probably too much and certainly just to do the best job that I can absolutely do all the time. So with that comes this kind of um, nervousness around whether I'm going to pull that off, you know, but mm. I've, I've just sort of learned to work with that over the years. And um, yeah, it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. And you hear lots of, you know, great sports people or actors or whatever. And they're like, if I'm not nervous, that's when I'm worried, you know? Um, so, yeah, it's more like uh, the anxiety that you have before something when you know you're really not prepared and you should be. That's not so good, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bro. I, you're I like, oh, shit, I don't know my lines. I'm going to have to just like improv this, you know, like that's not the kind of nerves you want to be working with. <laughs> And that that leads into another thing we were just talking about my first experience on a film set and i was uh second ac for b camera and movie technician never had done those before and with the movie i had like an hour experience before when we were at the camera test nowhere near enough and first first shot of the day on day one was a movie shot <laughs> I was like holy <laughs> shit you know that that was that and, uh, weird feeling i was like <laughs> how did you go cuzzy how was it oh bro that, that that first shot how did it how many takes how did it go down no it worked out mean <laughs> but awesome the, the end of that day one was the freaking opposite we ended up um so there was final shot of the day and there was um they wanted director wanted two cameras and i had taken the the movie gimbal out of the the cage and then put it back in and I put it in the wrong way couldn't figure out what was wrong with it and it was playing up and then they had been waiting for me literally waiting for just me the whole everyone was standing still waiting for me sweating bullets and then the director ended up going now nah, we'll just take one camera for the shot and defeat defeat <laughs> <laughs> Bro, that's just straight out and out rejection eh you you just like it's, you just got rejected the ultimate it was like disappointment you know and there's one thing disappointment in letting yourself down but letting other people down man frack that's something else yeah and it's it's sort of like you're touching on something as well like just how high pressure a film set can be um you know like and and sometimes it can be kind of counter to i always find it fascinating because you know for me film is is you know somewhere between on the spectrum depending on what type of film it is somewhere between art and entertainment you know and that's sort of like elliptical and they might be both or they might be one end of the spectrum or the other end of the spectrum but like either way in creating even entertainment there's an art to creating that and you want to be really present and like aware and doing your best work it's like honestly man sometimes a film set is so counter to creating that atmosphere like everyone can just get so stressy and it's so like time oriented and like panicky and you've just got to like kind of try and just take a deep breath and like center yourself and remember what your real job is there 
And I, and I think like when you're less experienced, like you can lose track of that. Like, especially as like a young director or young producer, you can start to think the most important thing is like finishing on time or, mm. or like doing what everyone else is telling you that you need to do and continuity and all these other things where it's like, really your number one job is to capture the essence in the heart of the story. And I think that's sort of like a trick for learners. And I've definitely suffered from losing that in the past, you know? Um, but yeah, film sets can be crazy. And like the longer I go, the more I want to create an on-set environment that is actually best suited to the greatest storytelling being captured, you know? And it is doable. You know, there are changes we can make. We're not like a military operation, even though it can mm. feel like that. Like a film set is very hierarchical. It's very organized. There's a chain of command. There's all of this. The reason it is like that is because films cost a lot of money. And so you need to be efficient to not have leakage of, of money and resource because it's usually so tightly financed that we can't afford any waste. And so how can we achieve that same efficiency whilst also creating an environment that's emotionally sensitive because we're creating art and that's about human connection. You know, it's not about racing around like a chicken with your head chopped off, panicking about, you know, whether you've got the 18 shots before lunchtime, you know? Yeah, bro. What do you reckon is, is part of the solution to that? Do you think it's making, um, having smaller crews, longer, you know, what do you, what do you think is yeah part of that solution? It's a horses for courses thing. I think, bro, like it depends. Like this, if you can have a small crew and still move efficiently, mm. um, I strongly mm. recommend it, you know? Um, um, one of the things I'm keen to really try and have a go at attacking if I can, and it's always tricky when like the commerce meets the, the real is, um, or meets the artistic desires. But um, one of the things I'd love to do, bro, is only shoot eight hour shooting days. Cause usually we do 10 and three quarter hour days and then plus overtime and, you know, it can be 13, 14 hour days. I know for me, when I'm writing, bro, my best work happens in the first two hours of the day from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. And after that, I can get more work done for another five hours, but not great work. Mm. And I certainly know by the time mm. I'm into um, hours 10, 11, 12, 13, I'm far from optimum, you know? And so I'd love to try and like shake up the labor approach, how we approach like the hours of the day. I think it's Clint Eastwood, bro. He always does an eight hour day. And wow. um, he just heavily rehearses like um, before. And then he kind of just goes in and he just, takes some time with the actors and it's all very patient. Um, and he'll just sort of talk through the scene with the actors and make sure everyone's on the same page. And he's got such a clear idea of what he wants. And then apparently he shoots very minimal takes. Like he'll only do one, two, three takes because yeah, wow. that's just his approach. Yeah. He's like, yeah, I really like that take. We're going to buy that one. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to uh... make up my own dead pool. <laughs> bro that's fascinating to me because his his movies are iconic you know obviously yeah. and bro like one of my all-time favorites of his is um mystic river because of uh, yeah. you know there's performances in there bro like sean penn powerful mesmerizing mesmerizing you know and bro, even million dollar baby like bro that's a powerhouse film you know yeah um, man no, nah, he, he's incredible, but it's like, you have to do what your thing is. Cause like, that's so Clint, like you, that it's even the tempo that he talks at. That's just mm. him doing his most authentic version of how he needs to make films. And I guess like your journey as a storyteller is, and a director and or producer and all those things is finding your most authentic version of that. Like, there's no way you can really rip anyone else off because I mean, you can learn from them. Like, I'm inspired by what mm. he's done there. But it's sort of got to suit my style and my tempo and rhythm and and, and the material, you know, because you've got your voice and then you've got <laughs> what the story wants to dictate. So, yeah, there's not really one fixed rule, you know. 
Yeah, bro. I love what you, you've said there. You know, it's important as um, collaborative artists, you know, because that's what filmmakers are, I think, you know, collaborative artists is um, doing what's appropriate for the story you're trying to tell as opposed to doing what you think is cool. It's like, oh, I'm real good at doing this stuff. So I reckon we should put it in. It's like, no, is that what is that what's needed? Yeah, hundred percent, bro. It's sort of those two things coming together. Cause like, you need the story to be your guiding light, you know. Um, but at the same time, you can't change who you are as a storyteller so much that it's like that you're overreaching or you don't even know what you're saying or talking about. So like. Even with the Panthers, for example, like when um, her life for Nora and I, Noah, my um, writing partner and co-creator of the show, when we came together and were talking about how we were going to approach that material, um, we had to be led by the true story. But we also, as like guys in their thirties who didn't live through that time and who make it uh, inspired by a whole sort of different point of reference and field of references, cultural reference, musical reference, everything, um, had to find a way of telling that story that's still related to who we are now so that we were speaking from a place of truth, have it mm. not lived that experience, you know? And that's how we kind of landed at this like mashup of like hip hop culture, um, you know, contemporary music references, a lot of the characters were even speaking in like more modern um, kind of vernacular. A lot of that was because we were going, well, let's bring our childhood and him and I growing up as young men, let's bring some of our experiences into the essence of what the Panthers themselves lived in the 70s, you know? Mm. And, and we hoped, it's quite a bold step, but we hoped by stepping out into that realm that we might be able to connect with our younger audience who didn't actually know the story of the Panthers and might not connect with it in any other way. So mm. they might not go and read a library book about the history of Aotearoa, you know? But if there's like a screen story that seduces them through the experience of young people and it's identifiable and they can see themselves in it, maybe by the end of the series they go far out what uncle did for us was actually flipping mean like you know and or you know our country isn't quite what like it portrays it likes to portray itself in 2022 and maybe there's some stuff still now that we need to look at that's kind of echoing what was happening 50 years ago you mm. know? so but like but yeah that that's that thing i guess of, of so it is always balancing what's the story commanding, but also what's my authentic way that I can bring my voice to it. Am I the right filmmaker for the story? You know, those are all things to ask at the beginning and try and find a way in because you just might not be the fit either. You know? Yeah. Bro, do you have um, do you have like um practices like meditative or, or otherwise, either in the morning or end of your your work day? just to help um, recenter you and to help um, not let anxiety get the better of you, or you know you know what I mean? Yeah, well, bro, I'm constantly looking at that. I'm always looking at that, trying to adjust that because I do get anxiety. Um, and particularly on like um, a lot of the business pressure side of stuff, really, I find extremely anxious, you know, and even this week I've been – um, you know, struggling with some of that stuff. But some of the things I do that really help, um, so one of the new things that I've been doing for the last year is um, Noah and I meet at the office and write from 6 a.m. till 10 a.m. every day. Sorry, five days a week, sometimes Saturday. And we give each other shit if the other person doesn't turn up or there's some cancellation. Like it's about <laughs> holding each other and holding ourselves accountable. Um and that for me is a spiritual practice because the morning is um, my greatest place of clarity. Um, mm. I try not to look at my phone in the morning if I can. Um, I sort of lost that practice for a while, but like try not to look at my emails and, and or like socials or anything. I just get up and try and come as fresh as I can from my rest to come and serve the work. And 
one of the other things that I try and do is when I just sit down at the computer, um, I just try and invite like the God of my understanding um, to um, work alongside me in that writing process and um, just to be guided by that um, greater um, intelligence of of the universe, whatever shape that takes for you. Like I know, you know what that is for me. Um, and it's just a short thing. I just take a moment, just a short karakia and then start the work. Um, and some days it will just flow. Usually the best hour, first hour is my best hour, bro. And like, I am prolific when I'm on, like I can write huge page count when I'm on. Um, but, it's like, as I say, that might be just an hour of like powering mm. and, and that's like full, like channeling kind of work where it's just like, just writing a stream of consciousness. If I can, if I can get in that space, it's just like writing, 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 not too much filtering, not too much critical stuff. And then after that first hour, I, I might stop when I kind of run out of gas. And then I'll move into a slightly different headspace. So I might go back through what I've written up to then and go into a more editorial. Oh, okay, I've kind of overwritten this scene. Um, I've kind of done this and da da da. Mm. So that's a big practice for me. Um, and then I, I'm a meditator in general. Um, but I've been so busy lately, bro, that um, my morning work has kind of been taking place of a seated meditation. I haven't mm. been able to get my seated meditation in as much as I, I like, but whenever I can, I'll, I'll sit. So I might sit three or four times a week for meditation. And then, bro, the other one that's absolutely key for me because I spend so much time sitting on my ass and that's working <laughs> out. Like, um, yeah. I, I can just get so anxious, bro, and so depressed purely just from not moving my body and really like mm. burning off some of that energy. So that's the other key ingredient. If I'm starting to get in a real bad place, I'm like, bro, you haven't been to the gym. You haven't been for a run. You haven't done Jack. It's just like common sense. And I just know now after years, it was actually Ruben Wiki who helped get me on that path back in 2017 when I was in a real bad patch. And I just joined him to just do burpees every day. Mm. And I just learned the power of that practice, bro. So, I always say burpees save my life. Wow, shout uh, out to Ruben Wiki. Yeah, shot Rubes. Yeah, Carver King, mate. He's he's the mantis and like <laughs> does so much of that beautiful, like does that mahi in the community for so many people. But it's like a simple thing that just get moving, man. Like mm. um, and you can forget it. So those are two those are the two biggest ones for me. Like get up and and do your creative work with discipline. Don't don't wait for creativity and, and inspiration to strike. Turn up. You've got to turn up every day mm. to give that the opportunity to strike. It's like it's like what you know, don't you, yeah, you gotta do your part, you know? Like and if you do your part and invite inspiration slash God, slash your ancestors, slash whatever your highest higher consciousness is. You, you can't expect that side to do all the work. Turn up and meet that every day, mm. every day, you know, and um, that's that's the big one for me. And then um, and then, yeah, keep the body moving, man. Um, wow. yeah. Bro, you, you're speaking to exactly the um, the journey that I've been on the last few weeks because I've sort of gone through a life changing period this winter you know both emotionally mentally you know and literally you know literally in winter but um one of the things i've, I've focused on recently was um scheduling in these practices you know like writing like i was i kept saying to myself like oh, i want to be a writer but like what does that even mean i want to be a writer like you either are or you aren't. You're writing or you're not. You know, and it was one of those um, deep conversations I had to have with myself and actually admit to where it's like, I'm saying this stuff, but I'm not doing anything about it. You know, so I purposefully scheduled in time to write, you know, even when it, it's the last thing I want to do. And, um, bro, it's, it's been game changing. And it, I'm, I'm so happy that you brought it up, you know, to, you have to meet it. And one of the sort of lessons that I've, I've just recently learned is 
about creativity you know it's it's not something that you passively wait to strike you it's something you have to proactively pursue 100 percent, brother yeah that's mean that you're on that journey too and um yeah, I just think like I just think diligence is like a really underrated quality in in art and in the creative mm. space. You know, it really is. There's sort of like this illusion, you know, or that that as I say, that like, you know, creative creativity just falls out of the sky and hits you one day and you know. Mm. And there are certain like songwriters and stuff like that who speak to that. Um but yeah, I just I know diligence is, is is and discipline is is a key part of it. And then it's like you know that's only to turn up. Then it's like when you're in the creative space, then you've got to let go and really remain open. And it's not about forcing or pushing um, that creativity. Um, you know, the discipline just gets you in the seat. You know, mm. but then then it's about loosening up again, handing over, not trying to control. You know allowing for a whole lot of like movement and, and outside energy to come in, you know? Bro, I listened to this podcast two years ago and it's the only podcast I've listened to like 10 plus times and it's with Robert Rodriguez and Tim Ferriss, you know, Robert Ooh. Rodriguez being a filmmaker. Bro, and he, he said exactly the same sentiment you're saying right now, which is you got to get out of your own way, you know? Like... Yeah. It's not you like making that stuff up, you know, it's physically you, but it's the, you know, when you let go of your inhibitions, you just let, let it flow, he says. And he goes, you don't even know how, how you're going to do it. You just turn up and then just let it all come out. And somehow it just keeps freaking turning up. Bro, big time. And like the beautiful thing is quite often like stuff comes out from your past in like different clothing. You know, mm. like, and you go, oh, shit, that's, I know what I'm bloody on about there. That's like back when me and um, the bro were da 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 you know? <laughs> and like, because that's what I love about writing as well. It's like, well, certainly for me, because I get, I, 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 and it's different, I'm sure for everyone, but what I love, bro, is just how personal it is, like my best, work that I'm doing, there is always some part of myself or my own experience in it. So yes, there's like a co-creation with a bigger energy. Um, but there is there is also yeah, it's just so, you know, so it's sort of almost like the antithesis of, of that, or like the, the, the um, is that you can only write what you know, you know, so yeah. like, you know, is it's like you just see all of your life experiences coming forward in these abstract ways, you know, mm. yeah, which is pretty awesome too. Bro, was there um, somebody along your journey that that taught you, you know, these sort of um, ideas around letting the writing just come out and turning up being disciplined and things like that? Or was it, were those um, lessons that you learned just from being – being in the industry and just from pursuing writing and things like that? Well, to be honest, my actual writing journey is I'm pretty young on that part of it because it's only the last few years that I've been writing before that I was a creative producer. And mm. so most of my work was with writers, but I was like um, getting those stories out of the writers and working with them. And mm. it was actually through that work of being on the other side of the partnership that I learned so much about writing because I could see the things that my creative partners and collaborators were struggling with or when something unlocked, like it's easier to see it in someone else than yourself. And so that was actually such a valuable like training ground that then by the time I'd got moved my own personal issues, some of them, <laughs> out of the way um, because I was never a writer or a director myself earlier in my career because I didn't think I belonged in that space. Mm. I didn't have the confidence in myself and I had some personal blockages. So I was always playing the creative supporter, enabler, collaborator, and I was strong in the creative space, but I didn't think I actually had what it takes to be writing and directing my own stuff. Um, but uh, when that all kind of unlocked and I stepped in to start writing, 
thankfully, man, that was like beautiful prep work. Because um, yeah. I, I learned so much from all of those people. You know, James Napier Robertson, who wrote and directed um, The Dark Horse, me and him came up through the game together. He's like still a close collaborator of mine. <laughs> and, and we learned together, like just on the job, you know. But I've learned a lot from him. Um, Roseanne Liang, the um, writer, one of the co-writer and director of Shadow in the Cloud, mm. same thing. Learned so much from collaborating with her. Um, yeah, but there wasn't like a mentor type person, and there wasn't like a book that told me how to do it. It was just me sussing that out. But you know, I'm a, I'm many years in the industry now, and in the creative development industry, you know, it's like I think I produced my first film at 21. Um, right. you know, and uh, that's, that's a, that's a long time ago now. And, and so I've been in the grind and I'm a, I, I'm, it's not a brag or a flex, but like, I'm one of the hardest workers in the game and have been like that mm, whole time. Cool. So like the line, the learnings that have come just from my grind, it's been like for better and for worse the top priority in my life for a lot of my lifetime, bro, is just like yep. dedicated to the craft that really has. And it's like, you know, now I'm moving into a chapter where maybe some other things in family and some other things start to become a greater priority. But I have a grounding of 15 years in the industry where being the best filmmaker and producer that I could be was honestly my top priority in life. Like, mm. you know, and so, I would bloody well hope that some good learnings have come from that. Far out. Man, if not, bro, far out, what have I been doing, you know? And it, it's like a lot of, in those early years, you know, and we, we didn't have to go into this intensely, but it's like in those early years, a lot of what was driving me was like pain and like, you know, deficit and just like my own personal kind of struggles and feelings of inadequacy and all of that. But that like gave me this fire to, mm. to drive and, and, and push hard and, and, you know, try to be great. And so like, you know, I don't regret or resent any of that. Like it's actually be, been awesome and it's all kind of fed into um, where I am now, you know, but now I'm enjoying my work, bro. Like it's just the yeah. last couple of years. First time ever, bro. I just love, I just love it. I'm just so happy in my work and it's just so creatively rewarding. And I love collaborating with Noor and James and all these other people. Mm. And, uh, bro, it's just such a privilege. And, and I feel like I'm in a hot spot of form too. Like, you know, I feel like my <laughs> shots, like, that, you know, it's, it's feeling, it's feeling sweet coming out of the hand. I'm like, yo, I'm so yeah, I'm just happy and, and um, it's a lot less these days about the result as well, like the success of projects and, and more just about that feeling of the jump shot, you know, it's mm, like, oh, you know, the oh, sweet release. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's a rhythm, you know, <laughs> and um, just trying to do things as we were talking about with those practices to cultivate that rhythm. Like, what can I do to make sure my shooting percentage goes up of it, of just like getting that sweet jumper, you know? Um, yeah. And that's just like, that's just, that's training. That's practice. That's mm. looking after my headspace, physical. And then that's just playing big minutes. And it's like going, yo, give me the ball. I want to shoot in the clutch. I want that now. Like, you know, that's my mm -hmm. role now. Like I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I want the ball in my hand down the stretch, you know? And so, yeah, it just feels good, bro. <laughs> bro, like that's the, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant energy you're talking about, you know, I'm thinking about um, how how Michael Jordan, he got asked, you know, like, it's the final shot of the game, who's taking the shot? And he's like, that's a dumb question, me, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, well, to totally, man. And it's like, you know, I'm just like, as I was talking about, it's like, I've got this awareness now that I've dedicated so much of my life to this. And if I'm going to continue to do that, it just better be great. Like mm. what, what we're working on better be great. It better be worthwhile as well for me now. Like the things I work on, I want to be a contribution. And that doesn't mean that it has to be worthy per se, 
it could be worthy just in the way that it makes people piss themselves laughing and gives them a break in, <laughs> from their day, you know, or like is an, is an incredibly enthralling distraction, but it mm. better be worthwhile, right? And yep. it better be great. Like I'm not here to make stuff that's not great no more, or at least for me to throw everything at it being great. And, you know, so that's, that's the space I'm in. And I think, um, yeah, that won't always be the way. Like, MJ loses games. Kobe had terrible seasons with, like, just missing the pieces. And, you know, mm. and it's like, it doesn't always mean that every project's going to work out how you envisioned it. But, like, you have to strive for that. You have to be going for great. Like, honestly. Bro, you're wearing the appropriate T-shirt to be saying that stuff. And um, <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to pivot a little bit, bro. Like, What's it like working with your brothers, you know, like working with like Bueller or Panthers and, you know, Jordan, you know, is, is, that, um, oh, is that collaboration like harder or is it easier than working with, with people who oh. are, you know, acquaintances? Bro, it's so amazing that you should raise that because honestly, highlight day of my career um, was directing the scenes between um, Jordan Vakolo and Bula Kuali and the Panthers, the ones that take place in ISIS um, gang pad. I know um, the ones. Easy, yeah, easy career highlight, bro, for me because I always dreamed of directing and, and never thought I could be there. And then to be directing those scenes with two of my best friends at the absolute peak of their game, and we mm. did all this deep to go into that room like what people don't see in those scenes or what they see but don't know happened before is the months of preparation about who those characters are what they've yeah. lived in backstory what is the richness of things that have happened between ice and havili that are never even said and for me when i watch those scenes thanks to those beautiful performances by the brothers i feel all that i see all that behind their eyes and like, mm -hmm. I am so proud of those scenes and of those men to be that vulnerable. It's, it's such a big ask, bro. And they trusted me and met me in that space and we created something beautiful. It's my, my, my highlight of my career, that one, that day, bro. Um, bro. It was was just, that all in a yeah, day, that, that scene? Yeah, yeah, those, yeah, there's like two massive scenes and we shot both of those in one day in like quick ah. time, really, bro. Is, again we were talking about that pressure earlier like the pressure and we were just i was just going don't listen to the pressure stay out of the room like anyone who's got trying to bring pressure don't bring it into this room this room mm. can't is not can't have that mm. these guys are like in a space right now man like like they <laughs> have to we have to protect the environment around them they have to just stay in their bubble but bro, they just killed that. They killed it, bro. Right. Like both of them, so strong in the series. And like, bro, Jordan V, he hasn't even done much acting, bro. And that guy was like, he shredded it, bro. Like he he put bro. that stuff in a body bag. <laughs> Frack, bro. Like bro. I just want to I just want to say a few things about those two fellas. Um, first we'll start off with with um Jordan. Frick, because, you know, we, we all see Jordan and, you know, the personality that he is online, you know, which is just a, a small um, part of who he who he is as a, as a whole person. Um, but, you know, the total opposite of, of Havili as a character. And, bro, he, he freaking sold me. You know, he was like a freaking asshole. He was, um, you know, he was like a big presence whenever he was on screen. And to see their contrast when he was in that scene with with um the brother Bueller, you know, you could see their big presence start clashing with another huge presence. And um bro talking about Bueller, I remember watching him on Shoreland Street and I said this out loud to my partner at the time. This might have been like 2011 and I said there was one scene he was doing and it was a super emotional scene and I was like Frack, this fella's the best follower on the show. And I was like, this fella's going to make it. He's going to make it. And I, I was saying it to my partner, like, heaps. And when he when he made it, I was like, Frack, see, I told you, I told you. This fella freaking killed it, and he deserves all the props he gets. And, bro, yeah, he was a freaking monster. But, you know, like, bro, a monster that was made in that environment. 
Bro, any actors, young actors who want to like take a leaf out of Bueller's book, just realize that he's the hardest working and most committed actor like in the game. Like the work that he did for for free before even turning up in Aotearoa to shoot the Panthers, bro, the work that he did, the months of work that he did to get inside the headspace of that character is like the, the work ethic is through the roof. He, he he takes it to another level. His commitment. So like, good luck to anyone. Like, <laughs> they, they've got to like, they've got to, they've got to, if they're going to work with him, they've got to come at that level. And to be honest, mm. Bueller set that standard for Jordan V to come to. And Jordan yeah. V was more green from the acting side. But what you've got with Jordan V is someone who is such a natural performer. Yeah. And like, his comedy stuff is actually what served those scenes so great. Because even though it's got this heaviness and this depth, like just Jordan V's kind of quick wit, his fast like motor work in the brain, and then mm. like his little touches of comedy as Havili is what really like elevates this character and gives it like an unexpected quality. Yeah. And bro, both of them as both of them as well, bro, are just seriously competitive. So they don't want to <laughs> like they don't want the other guy to come and like kill the scene and they look like a chump and get acted out of it. So we were all just we were all there going, let's make something real special. And then it's mm. like, then the humility comes in and goes, okay, now like we've done all that. There's all that stuff going on, but it's like, just leave the egos out and just try and come and do something great. But like, bro, you're so right. What people see of Jordan V is one small part. There's another part to him as well, bro, which is a giant heart with mm. like, like Godzilla um, size empathy <laughs> and like, one of the great qualities that like an um, actor needs is human empathy and understanding. And both of those guys, Bula and Jordan, have it in droves. And I think like that's what serves them too. Yeah, bro. And it's it's befitting you bring up that word empathy. That's I particularly put in your intro empathy because I think um, as a as a a storyteller, you know, if to be a good storyteller, let's put it that way. I think to be a good storyteller, you have to have empathy because it, it becomes selfless, you know, and it becomes about um, people outside of yourself. You know, it's not about trying to do, create a um, a movie or a, a television show that's like my best work because I'm a, I'm a good director or writer or whatever, but it's about creating an appropriate, respectful, empathetic story that is a small window into a house you know that that tells this full story and i think that's what you are brother ah oh, thank you brother yeah that's very kind and um yeah i think it's you know i i think like part of what gives me empathy bro is just all the stuff that i've stuffed up in my life you know <laughs> it's just like you know it's just like i've just made so many mistakes and got so many things wrong and it's just like <laughs> the older i get the longer that list gets and the less judge <laughs> the less judgmental i get because the more i go well man there could have been you you know and mm. and so like in a way what i'm passionate about with story and characters and I think the best stuff I've been involved in and my contribution to it is exactly on that level is like making the, the central characters more empathetic. Um, mm -hmm. And what I love is like the challenge of making characters empathetic that otherwise people might write off, you know? Yep. I think that was a big chance of a big part of my contribution to the Dark Horse, for example, was yep. I was always fighting for Genesis Portini, who to me was one of the greatest human beings I'd ever met. And I was like, I, I want audiences to see and understand this beautiful man, just despite things that might block, like aesthetic things that might mm. block audiences to getting to know him. And I thought, what about if there's this beautiful poetic story that helps us to see this heart of, of a man who's sort of been written off by society or big parts. Yes. You know, and the same on the show that, um, uh, we're writing at the moment, um, you know, the central character is like, he's an outlier of society, you know, but he is truly one of the most brilliant minds and, and most wise humans I've ever mm. met. And so I love 
the privilege to bring his story and make it more accessible to a wider audience. But yeah, empathy, bro, is what it's all about. It's all about that. Even with the baddies, the best yes. baddies, bro, aren't baddies. They're flipping complex like villains who we go, man, I love that guy. No, I shouldn't because yeah. he's an asshole. But like, I, <laughs> I, I understand. Wanna, you know, and that's like, you want to be empathizing with everyone. It's like, you know, if you're telling a divorce story from the perspective of the husband, it's like, you really want to understand the wife's perspective. Like, don't just write mm -hmm. that off. It's like, you know, it's, you know, it's like, it needs to be complex, nuanced, balanced, empathetic. It's like, that. that's where the magic is. That's the sweet spot. Yes, bro. And because some of my favorite, and I, I remember watching um, a masterclass with um, Aaron Sorkin, and he was talking about um, he doesn't, believe in villains you know there's there's no villains you just have um you know somebody who is uh misunderstood often you know or who is uh the opposite to um your protagonist or protagonist correct so but, they can still you know. be in conflict with what yeah wants and so therefore they're still providing antagonism but you don't have to judge them that's yes the step, is like don't bring your judgment you know to, to that they can actually be a much more dynamic and damaging antagonist without you know um being just a, a blanket bad person you know mm. what even is that what even is that you know who even is that there's like a tiny margin of people on the earth who like you know have a mental condition that makes them truly evil and sure yep. there might be a place for them on screen but most people have a story that, and have a, have reasons for behaving in the way they do, you know. And so, whether that's explained or it's just in the subtext, you as the storyteller need to understand who they really are underneath their behavior, you know. Yes, bro. And and it's you know for those of you listening and, and watching, um, it's you know when we watch stories, they are reflections of you know aspects of real life and you know society and that's what is so terrible about labeling someone as just a baddie you know that's what people do in real life they just say oh no they're just freaking they're just criminals you know without trying to understand the the journey and the story behind that person to to get them there because one thing one beautiful thing that i read in um how to win friends and influence people, which was a conversation between Abraham Lincoln and his wife was um, something along the lines of, um, you know, we, we don't understand what they have been through because, um, you know, we've, we haven't lived their life, but we cannot expect to be in any different position if we lived the exact life that they lived. Boom. And bro, like what a beautiful thing to, take into the realm of storytelling because mm. you 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 have the benefit as a storyteller to provide context that you don't get from a news headline you know yeah. you know so or a first impression of seeing someone on a on the street you have you have the privileged you can have the privileged position as the storyteller to go places that no other person can go you know like yeah Man, you know that's that's one hell of a of a privilege bro and a, and a and a cool thing to dedicate your work to and as i say all of this doesn't need to apply to just some inspirational drama you know it can be the same in like a heightened um silly fun genre movie like mm. <clears throat> um you know the dip that roseanne and myself in a supporting role, but like had, for example, Beneath Shadow in the Cloud and like what all of that represents for her and that character, and, you know, um, and there's a there's a lot in that, you know, um, and, but yeah, that's it, bro. Like empathy for me, that's the whole point. It's like, that's really what it's all about is growing empathy. It's an empathy machine. Um, what yeah. we do. You know, that, bro, that's what it is. Um, I don't know if, if you've written any like stories that are purely just fiction and you know made up but when when like let's say you're writing a story and you have a 
protagonist and an antagonist and then you're writing them with that empathy in mind and then you know like do you get to a point where you're like damn i think this antagonist should be the protagonist you know yes (laughs) does does that happen bro yeah well like talking about bueller's character before bro ice independence like i became pretty damn fascinated with him you know and (laughs) um yeah but um i I think like that's what that's a that's a good sign you know um Mm. because that means they have really become three-dimensional and i think all that should do um is push you to make your protagonist stronger because it's like okay wow now ice is becoming so 3d and interesting i've really got to work on will's character and make sure that he's just as compelling and what he's going through, you know, he can't be blown off the screen by the antagonist. But um, yeah, so Ice is probably a good example, bro, where I became yep. pretty obsessed, pretty obsessed with their character. But in the end, what I'm, what I love is he doesn't even have that much screen time. He's not on screen all the time, but when yeah. he comes, it hits different, you know. And um, so. Yeah, no, nah, I, I, but, but I think like if you're deciding if I think you'd want to be making that decision pretty early if you felt like maybe your antagonist should be the protagonist and it should mm. be an anti-hero, you know, a lot of TV now has got that, like you know, the anti-hero archetype is yep. like actually your protagonist, you know, it's someone that's heavily flawed, um, mm. um, and yeah, that's happening a lot and. Um, it used to be a lot harder back in the day to kind of pitch that and get people over the line with like, do we really want to go on with this on this journey with this character? They're so unlikable. That used yeah. to be the binary kind of response, which always pissed us off. <laughs> it's like, like, we don't care whether they're likable. Are they interesting? Are they compelling? Yes. Is it like three dimensional? Are you fascinated? Are you drawn in? And it's like, thankfully now a whole lot of great TV stuff and film but definitely in the tv space is like busted that wide open where it's like it doesn't matter if they're likable are they engaging Mm. telling are you riveted by them and that can be a nasty like character you know that can be someone who's morally very out of alignment like but that you know but they're recognizable we empathize with them on some level you know and we go yeah "Yeah, i get where they're coming from you know i i know someone like this you know Bro, you know who I think is a perfect example of of those things you were just saying is um Wagner Moura, his um his take on Pablo Escobar in Narcos season one and two. Cause like before watching that, bro, I had no idea his story. I'd obviously heard his name, but I didn't know what he had done and you know the atrocities he had committed. But bro, I, I love the the nuance that they they added to his character and like the acting was amazing but you know he he wasn't just that this one dimensional um baddie for being a baddie's sake just because he wanted more you know he, he was a, a loving and um caring husband to his wife and I, I don't know if this is what the real person in real life was i can only talk about this um this version of him in the show but you know like he did all of these things that pissed you off but you just couldn't take your eyes off him that that's it bro like and what a what a great character don't forget as well um cliff curtis actually played um pablo escobar yes, in and Blows. yeah back in the day yes. and bro he was a pretty slick version eh? like that was in cliff's era when cliff was going back to back with all those like um supporting roles mm. and just like mm. working with some of the best directors in the world and just smashing it out of the park like you know training day oh, three kings yep. or like that that run that he had um but yeah no that's that's a great example and like you also touched on something interesting which ties into a lot of the work we do which is how much of that was in the true character and yes i don't know either but like in what we do as dramatic storytellers adapting true story is like we will take liberties to make that character like creative liberties to mm. make that character mm-hmm. at times a certain way more or less this and that's kind of like part of our job as 
the fictional or ad, 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 adapters of the work, you know. Yeah. And what what like we had to do quite a bit of that in the Panthers. There's a bit of that in the Dark Horse. It's sort of like every big story adaptation that you see will will do that. What you try and do is never do anything that is compromising the essence or integrity of the story. Like, mm. you know, you never want to reach the point where you're glorifying a character who did horrific things, you know? Yep. Um, um, but, yeah, it's a really interesting topic, man, because it's like, um, you know, and sometimes you get run over hot coals for that, like when you take some of those liberties. But it's like... yeah. You know, it's a really tough space to work in. And it's like one of our first jobs as like director and producers, we have to honor the integrity and kind of capture that in a poetic way. But we also have to make the most compelling version of the story that gets that message through to an audience and yes. like hit the next, you know. Um, yes. So that, that's one of the biggest challenges, bro, of adaptation, you know. And yep. um, you can't, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Bro, that aligns with this lesson I learned from an artist, tattoo artist, oh, mixed media artist, but mostly tattoo artist, Jeff Gogwe, he's this American dude, and um, he wrote this small uh, book, and in that book, he was talking about painting, and he said, he learned this lesson from one of his teachers back in the day, and it was, when you paint, like, let's say you're painting a portrait, you got to paint more of what's there, you know, if, if their hair is red, you paint it more red than what you can see. And what it's about is it's about communicating the most important parts of what you're seeing. So it becomes Ooh. more more obvious, you know, and I think that's that's what you're saying, you know, with adaptations, it's making the parts that should be more potent, more potent. So the message can't yeah, get that's, Bro, that's your job as the painter to go, well, I'm not going to make the nose, ears, eyes, and hair all bigger. It's mm. like, what is the part that, I'm choosing to that's speaking to me. And mm. that is again that thing of you as storyteller working with the um subject matter as it is and then you know with whatever greater energy you're working with and your collaborators. But it's like you have to make selections because you're not a documentary yes. maker. You're not you're not writing the Wikipedia on what happened of this blow by blow. You're selecting, curating. You know, and if it's the eyes that jump out at you, that's what you've got to go with, you know? Mm. Uh, so it's a tricky, it's a, and it, man, when you're working with a really important story or someone's legacy or whatever, that's quite the responsibility, you know? Yeah. But you you also can get completely crippled by the responsibility if you're not careful, you know? So you have to, you have to like center yourself and trust yourself and consult and be careful and discerning, but then also get not, not get so crippled by the responsibility that you still remain bold in your storytelling. You have to take risks. You have to be brave. If like you're just making these your decisions as a storyteller out of fear of mm. you know what you might get wrong, like bro, you're gonna you're gonna end up with a pretty boring adaptation. You know, it's like a telly yeah. feature type TV movie. You know, it's like. Yeah, so it's a it's a bowl, it's a tricky one, bro. That's a bro. That's a tough one. <laughs> I appreciate that we're talking about this too, because um, I, I I can't imagine, but one day I'll know, you know, what it's like to to work with you know real stories or with real people, and not trying to lose your creative voice. But for a little, let's um sort of pivot a little bit and. You know, we're sort of getting towards the end of our conversation, but yeah. bro, I was talking to some of the um, some of the actors from Muru at the premiere, and I want to ask you the same question: When you watch for the first time, bro, like a, a production that you've done, I don't know if you've done it because you probably sit through the edits, but you know, like let's say first premiere, you know, the majority of people are seeing it. How are you feeling in in, in those moments, bro? Ah, uh, it depends on the film, man. Eh? Um, it depends on the film. Um, usually, like, a little bit anxious. Um, mm -hmm. Usually, like, that's not the best time for me to watch the film. And sometimes I'll just leave, like, and not watch the film with that first audience. Because usually there's, like, a, a, an expectation to socialize or speak or do something else in and around the event. And... 
I just can't really just engage in the material, enjoy the film. But yeah. on every film, bro, there's a time in the cutting room or the color grade or the sound mix where I have a screening and I go, ah, that was it. That was mm. my screening when I felt mm. really proud of this work. And even if it's not a perfect thing, I know it's the best version we could do where we yep. got to. It's the best version we could do. And sometimes it's like, holy crap, that's awesome. Like, I'm so proud of that. But usually that's a screening just for me or me and my key collaborators. Yep. Um, on the Dark Horse, I went and watched the film a couple of times just with a regular audience. And that was awesome, bro. I just went and bought a ticket, like, you know, <laughs> during its cinema run. And just sat yeah. in and felt audiences and heard audiences crying and being moved by that, you know. Mm, um, that's and powerful. Bro, like, you know, and the, the the premiere of that film just brought the house down as well, you know, like I've never experienced anything quite like that, like mm. in Civic, packed, and like you could hear audible, like weeping and like just cheering and like just to think in that moment, to take a moment and share that with Jen himself, Jen the man, yeah. Genesis 14, and just go, bro, there you are, man, like we uh, we got there. And like you passed away when we were developing the story, and now here we are, bro. Mm. However many thousand people cheering your story, acknowledging you. You are a hero yeah. in this moment, like unsung hero. And like, bro, that's that's another career highlight. But um, yeah, so it's different on each one, but um, usually I'll always at least get some moment through the process where I feel like very proud of the work and how we've got there yeah bro thank you for sharing that and um i think the message that i take away from that is to um find out the the best method for you as a as an artist as a creative person to appreciate your work you know you don't have to appreciate it in the ways that other people appreciate it but you know you find what works for you so you can actually absorb it and you know there's that's a lot of hard money man but um bro like we, we've just hit the hour mark and just to wrap up brother um what's um one piece of practical advice you would give to any um aspiring storytellers whether that be in television filmmaking even just writing um yeah we touched on this at the beginning actually and i think like it is it was actually off air before we um start the stream but um my big piece of advice is don't let the institution or the industry or whatever prevent you from creating so film mm -hmm. is a very expensive art form and you especially in this country we're so lucky whatever anyone says we're so lucky to have these funding bodies through the government and stuff that support us but that is only one pathway for you to create. And it's now mm. like, you know, if you can borrow someone's or if you've got one yourself, like a late model iPhone, like you've got a film camera in your pocket, you know, <laughs> and like you don't need thousands, hundreds, of thousands, millions of dollars to get out there and do it. To be a writer, you don't need the writing software if you can't afford that. Like there's no barrier between, the only barriers between you and creating are within yourself. And don't mm. let anyone tell you different, and including yourself, because if you are, you're making excuses. And even if you work a full time job and do whatever, get up before your babies wake up, get up, get up before you have to go to work and spend one hour creating. Like there is literally no excuse if that's what's calling your heart. And yeah, that would be my biggest piece of advice. Oh, bro, you're freaking giving me goosebumps right now. Um, brother, appreciate you um for for giving us an hour of your time and for sharing the you know some just a small amount of important lessons that you've you've learned along your journey as as a storyteller and thank you for sharing these you know these gems there were some crazy gems in there that you shared and i'm gonna be personally implementing some of those into my own life as an aspiring filmmaker myself um but brother like good luck to you for this next chapter of your life um you've you've been on an amazing journey and um everybody here you know our graph grims whanau um yeah we thank you 
Oh, kia ora, brother. It's been an absolute honor to um, share the space with you and, and uh, I love and respect you and um, hope that we get a chance to collaborate in the future. Um, um, but yeah, thank you so much to your time, for your time and thank you to anyone who, who checked it out. Kia ora, my brother.